Hey there, this is Matt Tyree with Trinity Animation, here to give you a rundown of the basics of Chaos Group's Phoenix FD. Phoenix FD is a fluid dynamic simulator used to create many kinds of effects relating to gases, liquids, and fire. As odd as it sounds, fire and smoke behave the natural laws of fluid dynamics and are, in a sense, fluids. To create the most basic possible simulation, we need three things. A simulation grid, a source helper object, and a node to emit from. Let's start by creating the grid. This can be found under the Create tab, Geometry. Scroll down to Phoenix FD, and it's called the Phoenix Simulator. It's important to be mindful of what viewport you create the grid in, as this will affect its z-axis, which is the direction that the simulation considers to be up. I recommend creating the grid in either the top or the perspective viewport so that our grid z-axis is pointing to world up. Otherwise you could end up with a sideways or upside down simulation, which depending on what you're trying to simulate, is most likely wrong. Next we need to create a source. Now the source is a helper object that acts as a container for the fluid's emission parameters. So this can be found under Create, Helpers, Phoenix FD and it's called the Phoenix Source. Even though it looks like an oil drum, it doesn't actually emit fluid by itself. Now when we go to the Modify tab, we can see that it has some default values when we create it that we'll go into more detail about later. But these default values are sufficient for a simple flame animation. So finally, we need to create the node. The node can be any geometry or particle system within your scene that's within the grid. In our case, we're going to use a sphere. To get started with our simulation, we need to define our geometry as a simulation node for our source object. We do this by selecting the source, clicking Add, and selecting our sphere, which then adds it to the associated nodes list. This tells Phoenix to emit fluid from whatever nodes are in this list. By default, it wants to emit from geometry with a polygon ID of zero. So we could put an Edit Poly modifier on the sphere and change its polygon IDs to B0, but since I know that a sphere's polygon IDs are set to 2 by default, let's just change the source polygon ID to 2. Now it's time to run our simulation. Pick the grid and press Start. As you can see in the viewport, flames and smoke have started erupting from the sphere's surface. One of the nice features of Phoenix FD is that we can still interact with our scene while it simulates. We can rotate around and see it from all angles, and we could even change parameters and view the effects the changes have in real time. For example, if I increase the discharge amount, we'll see that it's erupting much more violently or I could also decrease it, and the opposite happens. This simulation was relatively quick, but for an even quicker simulation, we're going to decrease the grid's resolution. The resolution of the grid is a function of the cell size, these little tick marks within the volume, and the grid's length, width, and height. You can see the total amount of cells based on your current values here, and this is usually a good indicator of how quickly it's going to simulate versus how finely detailed the simulation will be. The higher the number of total cells, the slower and more detailed the simulation will be. By default, the cell size is one inch, and we see little one inch tick marks in the volume of our grid, however large we make it. You can think of it like pixel resolution. The larger the cell size relative to the grid's dimensions, the fewer cells we have, thus the resolution is lower. Likewise, the larger the pixels in an image appear to be relative to the image's dimensions, the fewer pixels it has, thus the lower the resolution it is. So you could manually change the values to adjust the resolution, 
But if you, have, if you have already defined the dimensions of your grid as you want them, a quick way of increasing or decreasing the resolution of your grid is to use these buttons. It's a good idea to work with a lower resolution grid when you are setting up and testing your simulations in order to keep your feedback loop quick. You can turn the resolution up later for the final output. Now when we run the simulation, it's much quicker. So when we run the simulation, what Phoenix is doing is calculating the behavior of the fluid per frame based on the specified simulation parameters and then outputting a .aur file per frame. This is similar to the process of pre-calculating a lighting solution or a physics simulation. So by default, the .aur files are placed in the same implicit path as the max file you're working from. But by opening the output tab, you can specify a location to write the files to, and the input value will pull from that location by default. It's a good idea to save your max file and define a specific location for your Phoenix output data beforehand to avoid inadvertently overwriting your simulation. So let's do that now. And if we run the simulation again, and then open the path that we saved it to, we'll see that it is in fact generating a .aur file, .aur file per frame. So now let's discuss some of the source parameters and the effects that they have. Let's start by lengthening the timeline so that we have more time to simulate. And I'd also like to shrink the sphere so we can see more of the flames. Pick our simulation grid and start simulating. There are several parameters available, but for now we'll concern ourselves only with discharge, temperature, and smoke. As we've seen, discharge controls the speed of the fluid into the simulation. By default it's set to 40, but if we increase it, the fluid discharges into the simulation at a higher speed. It's like turning an oven burner up. Likewise, if we decrease it, the speed of the fluid decreases. The next parameter we're going to discuss is temperature. Temperature controls the temperature of the fluid in the Kelvin scale. By default it's set to 2000, which is the temperature of molten lava. You can learn more about the Kelvin scale to get a better idea of what temperatures you want to work with for what you're simulating, but a few useful Kelvin temperatures to be aware of are a match is 1700 Kelvin, lava is 2000 Kelvin, the freezing point of water is 273 Kelvin. The boiling point of water is 373 Kelvin. And room temperature is 290 Kelvin. This doesn't yield much in the way of fire, of course, so let's turn it back up to lava. And now let's discuss smoke. Smoke controls the relative concentration of the smoke in the simulation. By default it's set to 1. If we wanted to, the smoke to be thinner or thicker, we could adjust the value. Or if we just wanted flames only without any consideration of smoke, we could turn it to zero, or simply uncheck it. Phoenix FD will automatically consider any geometry that's within the grid to be a deflector for the fluid that's discharging from the source. So for example, let's create a tube.
And let's re-enable our simulation. And why don't we just go ahead and turn the discharge up a bit. Now, if we take this tube and start interacting with the fire, it interacts just like you would expect. It starts conforming to the shape without any extra need to um, include the tube in any kind of a list or anything like that. You can also create space warps that will influence the simulation, although they don't need to be within the grid. So for example, if we create some wind, angle it just so, you can already see its effect, but why don't we turn it up a little? Now you can really see the wind has definitely having effect on our simulation. One final thing to note for smoke and fire is that you can control its color and transparency by making adjustments in the colors and transparencies menu in the rendering tab. Now, we haven't really discussed rendering yet, so let's discuss it now. All we really need to do, even with scanline, is to just render it. Let's go back a few frames before we added the wind. And now we can see that just with a simple render, it looks pretty decent. Uh, we had turned smoke off, which is why we don't see any. But we have control over the color of the flames and the smoke down here in this rendering rollout. And here's the colors and transparency dialog. This dialog can look a bit scary, and it does go rather in depth, but it breaks down pretty simply. There's three basic areas of control. We have emission, diffuse color, and transparency. Emission is the self-illumination color for the fluid when the temperature is high enough to combust. By default, this is assigned to the temperature channel, and it has a nice red to yellow-white gradient based on the temperature. Default values are recommended for basic fire, although you can change the colors in the gradient to make any colors you want. So let's just turn these all, why not, blue. And let's see if we can get ourselves a nice blue gradient. In fact, why don't we just simplify this, get rid of all those color points, and we'll go from blue to white. Now let's see what we get. It's definitely changed color, although of course this color gradient is based entirely on the uh, actual temperature that's going on. So if we wanted to adjust it, perhaps we just want to turn the entire thing blue. Let's see what happens if we clamp it there. Still not really seeing it, so let's just make all three points blue. There we go. Moving on, diffuse color is the color of the smoke. So why don't we go ahead and just re-simulate this with our smoke turned back on. Delete that tube, and the wind. And start our simulation. Hmm, ah, that's right. Smoke was set to zero. So let's set it back to one. Restart our simulation. There we go. 
Let's go ahead and pause it right here, Aim. Okay, so now we have a nice blue fire making pretty normal looking gray smoke. So let's open our colors and transparency dialog here and move down to diffuse color. So as I said, the diffuse color is the color of the smoke or any part of the fluid vapor that's not burning. Simple color is the default value and it works pretty well for quick control of the smoke color. We can easily make, well, I don't know, has about some orange smoke. This might look a little backward because you would expect the smoke to be gray, but maybe it's some sort of a chemical fire and it's putting off strange colored vapors. So you can easily create some pretty interesting effects. There's also other ways of controlling the temperature, but for the time being, simple color works relatively well. Finally, we have transparency. Transparency is the way it maps the transparency or opacity of the fluid based on this diagram. If we switch it off of simple smoke, it actually will start to use this diagram. And so what we get is a very different result. This would really be more like cigarette smoke for the way that it's currently set up. If we simulate a little bit farther, maybe turn the smoke value up, this may become a little more obvious. Let's say two. Pick our grid, restart the simulation. Now we can render it while it's still simulating, which is another pretty nice feature. As you can see, there's a lot more detail going on in the smoke here based on this transparency diagram. By default, it is set to simple smoke, which then ignores that diagram. It gives you more of this cloudy result. To give an example of a practical situation for creating a fire and smoke simulation, we could imagine a character walking with a torch. Here I've created a simple biped and applied a motion capture file. I built a simple torch and linked it to his hand, and specified the sphere at the head of the torch as our node. I turned on trajectory for the torch so that we can see exactly the area that we need our grid to envelop. And once we've specified our outputs, we can begin simulating. I've already created a separate folder for our torch output. So let's watch it go. It's simulating fairly slowly, so why don't we decrease the resolution of the grid? One other thing to note is that I have enabled Adaptive Grid. And what this will do, since it's based on the smoke channel, is it'll actually change the size of the grid depending on the uh, behavior of the fluid in the simulation. So what it'll do is as the smoke is rising, it will extend the grid upward until it disappears. So decrease that resolution and start our simulation again. All right, now it's going a bit faster. And you can see the size of the grid is actually changing automatically. This is useful because we don't need the grid to be at its full height based on the simulation for the entire time. So this actually saves us some calculation time. Now that we've covered the basics of smoke and fire, it's time to discuss the basics of creating liquid. The process for creating liquids is similar to creating fire and smoke. We need to make a grid, a source, and a node. So let's do that now. 
Geometry Phoenix Simulator, making sure to drag our grid out in the perspective viewport. And we'll come down to Helpers, Phoenix Source. And in this example, we're going to use a cylinder. The cylinder is going to act as kind of a faucet. Now again, we could put an edit poly modifier on here and change it to whatever polygon ID we need it to be, but since I know that the base of a cylinder is by default set to 2, I'll just change the source polygon ID to 2. Now we're not yet ready to simulate. We, ne we need to specify one of our simulation channels to be liquid. We do this by opening the liquids dialog here and changing this from disabled to one of these three options, temperature, smoke, or fuel. I'm going to pick fuel, although it will work with any of them. Now we need to come back to our source object and enable the fuel channel. Since we're simulating water, we probably don't need smoke, so we can get rid of that. Now we're almost ready to simulate. First we need to add our cylinder to the simulation. And we need to make a couple more quick adjustments. We need to come down to output, which specifies all of the information that's going to go into your .aur files. We'll disable smoke since we aren't using it, and we'll enable fuel. Now we're ready to start simulating. Well, that doesn't look right. So let's see what's going on here. Ah, the problem is that we're still using the temperature of molten lava. So why don't we lower that a bit to say room temperature. Okay, let's try that again. There we go. Now it's looking a bit more like fluid, although it's still not quite behaving correctly. This is because the dynamics by default have vorticity set to 0.5. Now you can think of this as sort of a turbulent field that the fluid is uh, having applied to it. In the cases of fire and smoke this is much more correct for what we're doing, but in the case of uh, this simple liquid coming out of a faucet we should probably just go ahead and set it down to zero. So we'll do that, and we'll re-enable our simulation. And uh, now that's behaving much more like, a f like water from a faucet. Now, what you can see is happening here is it's pouring right through the boundaries of the grid. This is because, by default, our grid boundaries are set to open, which means the fluid acts as though there's nothing there. However, it will disappear beyond the borders. Now, we have different options here. What we want to do is switch it to jammed. Now what jammed does is it treats the boundary like it's a wall. So we have a few options for jammed. Jammed minus means that for the selected axis, uh, for the selected axis it'll make the, uh, the negative direction act as a wall. Jammed plus makes the positive boundary act as a wall. And jammed both will make both of them act as a wall. So in this case, why don't we just set everything to jammed both? And we'll rerun our simulation. And now we can see the fluid is actually bouncing off of the boundaries as if there's solid walls there. And it begins to fill our volume. The other option, which is wrap, pretty much makes the boundary loop around and repeat, kind of like a Mobius strip. So the fluid would leave through one side and enter from the other endlessly. So if we were to try and render right now, we wouldn't see anything. This is because liquids need to be rendered in V-Ray mode. So let's switch our renderer to V-Ray. 
And then there are still a couple of other adjustments that we need to make. So let's select our simulation grid and scroll down here to rendering. We need to change the effects channel from temperature to fuel, which lets the renderer know that we're feeding the information from the fuel channel for our liquids. And if we try to render now, we still don't get anything. That's because liquids need to be re rendered in geometry and solid mode. So now when we render, we get a randomly colored fluid that in this case looks quite a bit like blood or red paint. What we need to do is apply a shader to our simulation grid. So let's really quickly make a V-Ray material. We'll make it reflective with Fresnel. We'll make it refractive. We'll give it a little bit of specular glossiness. and we'll apply it to our simulation grid. Now, obviously, any kind of real world situation, there would be some kind of an environment to reflect and refract. So let's go ahead and just create a simple one in our environment channel. We can make a simple gradient ramp Tell it to be a spherical environment. Flip it 90 degrees. We just want the map, so we don't need the material itself. And we'll drag it over to our environment as an instance. Now let's try rendering again. This helps us more clearly visualize the liquid. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed learning some of the basics of Chaos Group's Phoenix FD. Visit us at www.trinity3d.com for more info.